Hi, in this talk you will learn how to make procedural water waves boundary aware. This is joint work of NVIDIA and IST Austria. In this introducing example, note how the procedure water on the left intersects the terrain, giving implausible behavior. On the right, we applied the ideas of this paper, providing a more realistic animation. Looking at the state of the art in water simulation, the first class of methods solves the full Navier-Stokes equations. We show only two representatives from the huge number of existing work. We note that these methods respect boundaries, but they generally do not scale well to larger scenes. To improve the scaling, numerous 2.5D simulations have been proposed, again showing here just two representatives. These methods still mostly respect boundaries and scale better, but still much worse than the third class of methods, namely procedural animations. These scale very well, but they do not respect any boundaries. So this work tries to improve this situation. The core of our method is a spatial animation filter that we call wave cages. This is the procedure wave setup which is the input to our method. At the water surface at rest, we show a few representative red points. Now we increase the wave amplitude and see how the surface points get displaced while forming a circular motion. At the same time, the water surface intersects the terrain in an unrealistic fashion. Let's have a look how this looks in an actual scene. This little dent is filled with procedural water at its rest configuration. When applying a procedural water animation, the water interpenetrates the terrain unrealistically. As a naive workaround, one could taper water displacement simply to be zero at the waterline as is shown here. However, notice how this unrealistically freezes the movement at the waterline. By contrast, we propose so-called wave cages, which are essentially ellipsoids arranged along the rest surface. Note how they give a sliding motion at the waterline. The same can be observed in this scene. Note how the wave cages keep the water moving at the boundary while no interpenetration with the terrain occurs. Let's have a look how an individual wave cage transforms a point on the water surface. We start with the wave cage here drawn as an ellipse. It is defined by its major and minor axes A1 and A2 as well as the respective major and minor radii, R1 and R2. Now given some input surface point, eta, our goal is to constrain eta to lie inside the cage. In a first step, we define a unit circle, here drawn in red, and soft clip eta to lie within this circle using the sigmoid function on the right. This gives us normalized position eta m. For details, we refer to the paper. Note how the eta n stays within the unit circle no matter how far we displace eta from the center. In a second step, we project eta n onto the two ellipse axes and multiply by the major and minor cage radii, giving us the constraint point eta c, here shown in blue. Note how the circular motion of the input point gets smoothly mapped inside the cage. The only parameter for this mapping is the sigmoid steepness S. It acts as a sort of compression factor and here we show how it influences the output. A small S simply reduces the overall motion. We set S to 0.5 which mostly reproduces the input. Increasing S amplifies the waves but compresses wave ripples at peaks and valleys. 
Having established the wave cage transformation, let's see how we can use it to constrain waves in a scene. We lay out a simple regular grid on the water's rest surface, where each grid node holds its individual cage parameters. We interpolate this information over all of space as shown here by the moving cage. Each individual cage gets assigned the axis A1 as the terrain surface normal below its position. The second axis A2 is a vector pointing towards the closest shoreline that is made perpendicular to A1. The third axis A3 is now simply a vector perpendicular to A1 and A2. What's left to be defined are the cage radii R1, R2 and R3. In general, we want to make them as large as possible, only limited by a user-defined maximum radius for the water motion. But of course, cages are not allowed to touch the terrain, as this would again cause interpenetrations. In our simulation, we first grow the radius R2, which is the main horizontal water motion at a beach, for example. Then we grow R3, and finally, R1. Each growing process stops if the cage touches the terrain or a user-defined maximum radius is reached. Note that for cages centered below the terrain, the role of terrain and air is reversed, meaning they grow until they just touch the terrain surface. In addition, we invert the radius R1 for the surface normal. This provides the linear motion at the waterline when cages are interpolated. Here is an example how wave cages are laid out in a scene. You can also see the grid used to store the cage parameters. Here is another example how cages adapt to a shallow terrain. An important point to note is that in the radius fitting process, cage growing might stop immediately at concave terrain boundaries, as shown in this figure. This would shrink the cage to a single point, such that no water movement would be possible. To avoid this, in the fitting process we allow for a little intersection slack of about 20 cm, illustrated here by the red dashed area. We will address the minor interpenetrations caused by this in a minute. This example illustrates how the waterline is hardly moving when not applying the described slack. The cage reduces its sides towards the terrain boundary. By contrast, a slack of 20 cm provides this lively water line. And the horizontal cage size is kept towards the terrain. Another issue worth noting is that cage radii can abruptly change at the boundary, as visible here. This causes waves to unrealistically protrude over the boundary. We remedy this by spatially smoothing cage radii, as described in the paper. Here we again see how waves protrude unrealistically. And how we remedy this by smoothing the cage radii. Before rendering the water surface mesh, we process it in a special way at runtime. The first problem are small interpenetrations that are caused by the fitting slag mentioned earlier. We solve them by projecting all water vertices on top of the terrain. This successfully remedies all remaining interpenetrations. However, the vertex projection just described causes the water boundary to become jagged, as seen here. Our solution is to clip and retessellate the mesh at the waterline, giving this much smoother appearance. Finally, an issue is caused by the fact that we only process vertices of the water mesh.
This means triangle centers can still intersect with the terrain as shown here. If we make the triangles larger by reducing the mesh resolution, the problem becomes slightly worse. A possible solution would be to bias the Z-buffer in favor of the water mesh so that it gets always drawn on top of the terrain. We leave this as future work. Now let's have a look at some results. Here we show wave cages applied to different scenes. Note how the cages calm down the water around this column, such that no artifacts occur. Also note how the water behaves in a plausible way at shallow and at steep boundaries. By contrast, interpenetrations arise when not using the wave cages. Here is a more complex scene where we tested our implementation on a laptop with a decent GPU. For the 1 by 1 km scene that you see here in the background, we arranged wave cages in a 1024 square grid. Preprocessing our cages took about 2 seconds on the GPU. We based our implementation on the water surface wavelets technique proposed in 2018, which allows it to locally steer procedural waves, to align it with a beach, for example. The computational cost of the cage filtering at runtime mostly happens in the vertex shader for the water mesh displacement and in the pixel shader for the surface normal that is needed for shading. One can see that we maintain real-time frame rates at common resolutions with two times multi-sampling anti-aliasing enabled. Here is a view of the complete scene. To mimic breaking waves, we combined the procedure waves with the particle system. The additional material for this paper provides more implementation details about this. Here we see a drone view, showing no interpenetrations even in very shallow regions. This canyon fly-through shows that it also works well for steep walls. This dynamic boat wake produces waves rolling up the beach, again without producing interpenetration artifacts. Finally, we show a walk on a shallow beach. Again, intersection artifacts occur once we remove the wave cage filtering. In terms of future work, there are many ways to improve this method. First, the linear motion at boundaries could be generalized to naturally work at curved boundaries. This would reduce the need for the fitting slag, for example. Second, in deep water away from any terrain, all cages typically keep the same maximum radii. This calls for more efficient data structures like quad trees. Similarly, storing cages on a 3D grid should allow it to handle non-height field terrains. In addition, dynamically recomputing cage parameters locally would allow us to handle dynamic objects like boats. And finally, the wave cages so far only rely on geometric arguments. But of course, it would be interesting to also take physical behavior into account. This concludes this talk. The paper, video, additional material and binary can be accessed on the webpage linked in the description below. Thanks for your attention.